Thanks everyone for joining me as well. Um, so my name is Wyatt Gorman. I'm the High Performance Computing Solutions Manager at Google Cloud. <clears throat> my role at Google is really working with partners, with customers, um, and with our engineers to make sure that our customers' needs are met um, as well as possible and that um, as much as possible, those uh, solutions that we provide customers are documented publicly and that the software that we build for them or integrate with other partners is, is available for them um, and open sourced as much as possible. So I'm here today to tell you a little bit about Google's efforts uh, and focus around HPC uh, and how we're helping our customers solve some of their toughest challenges. So I want to start almost a couple decades ago, actually, when Google was in its infancy and when we saw that really the tools that we needed to accomplish our goals um, weren't quite there uh, really in the computer science space. Um, we looked around and, and we, we saw, you know, things like big data and um, similar tools weren't, weren't quite at the stage that we needed them to be. So we built the tools that we saw were needed um, and we open sourced them for everyone to take and improve, uh, really starting back with the Google file system that helped uh, start the object storage uh, movement as, uh, as being as popular and prevalent as it is today. Throughout things like MapReduce, which led to Hadoop and uh, big data tools, um, all the way through to Kubernetes, which is really key for managing most of the world's containers today. Um, and then we saw that others might benefit from the infrastructure that we were building. Uh, and so we started Google Cloud um, that would allow the world to leverage Google scale computing infrastructure really. Today, we're focusing most on three key areas, I would say, um, innovating in, in areas like machine learning with TensorFlow, quantum computing with CERC and some other recent innovations you might have read about, um, and high performance computing with things like the Genomics Pipelines API, today called the Life Sciences Pipeline API, um, and things like Slurm on GCP, among other things that we'll talk about a little more later in our talk. Our goal in enabling tools like Slurma GCP and others are really focused on one thing, democratizing high performance computing and really making running HPC on Google Cloud and in the cloud in general as easy as possible for as many people as possible so that everyone can do more in less time, build better products uh, and find solutions to our toughest problems faster than ever before. So I wanna start off by taking a look at a few of the problems that some of our customers uh, have focused on and are focusing on. So first, um, I really want to talk about something that's affecting everyone today, um, and that's climate change. You know, as the effects of climate change become more and more apparent each year, um, scientists are using the cloud both to better respond to climate-driven events, especially things like storms and floods, uh, to understand both how we can react to these events better, but also how we can forecast these events more accurately in the future. Um, so in a natural disaster, whether that's a storm, a fire, a, a flood, or you know, evacuation routing for people in the affected areas, um, you know, evacuation routing becomes a critical uh, and a life-saving tool. Um, as the frequency and scale of these storms starts to increase as our climate changes more and more rapidly, um, you know, so does the need for the ability to very quickly respond uh, in real time and provide things like evacuation routing. Um, so this urgent need for compute power is sometimes called urgent HPC. Um, it's a problem that's being considered sort of in the academic HPC community most right now. Um, but it's an idea that there um, may be situations like natural disasters where the demand for computational power will outstrip the supply or you know, really even what's available to any one organization in a very quick uh, manner. Uh, it's a challenge a lot of governments and large organizations are trying to solve right now. Um, there's a study going on in the U.S. government uh, around this kind of idea of um, urgent HPC and, and what resources are available for that kind of need. So Clemson University actually set out to do some research in this area and to test the ability to use public cloud resources to address an urgent HPC problem, um, specifically the idea that um, there would be a storm surge on the East Coast. Uh, in this case, they simulated a storm surge in the state of Georgia, and they needed to process a large amount of data to provide traffic evacuation routing in that emergency situation. So um, Clemson actually went ahead and collected several days worth of the state of Georgia's traffic camera recordings, 
Um, they collected over 200 terabytes of data and spun up as many cores as they could on demand uh, all over the globe of any uh, instance type that they could, any VM type, CPU type that they could, um, not, not choosing any favorites. Um, and they processed all of that data, that 200 terabytes of data, using a tool called Traffic Vision. Um, and they were able to provide traffic evacuation routing recommendations for the, the simulated scenario. In doing so, they actually set a new record for uh, the largest HPC job ever run, uh, as far as we know, in the cloud or maybe even outside of the cloud, with over 2.1 million cores, um, over 130,000 instances, uh, like I said, in every region of the globe. And they did that, <laughs> spinning up all those instances over just a few hours. So they really, you know, um, not to get too, too much into the details, but they went piece by piece and found uh, VMs all over the world. We'll talk about a feature that'll help that, uh, or would help that run a little bit faster in, in just a few slides. Um, and they found a few best practices that they were able to share in their paper, paper that they um, published to the Journal of Supercomputing. But generally, they were very pleased to find that the cost of the job uh, per core hour was actually comparable and, and even a little bit lower than what they pay uh, for their on-premises compute. So we're not only helping um, organizations understand how to respond to these kinds of climate change events, but we're also working closely with a number of organizations throughout the world that are focused on climate. Last year, CloudTech's uh, Climate Modeling Alliance, CLIMA, announced that it had released the first public version of its new CLIMA Earth, model, uh, Earth System model, excuse me, uh, which runs on Google Cloud and which promises to harness more data than ever before to produce more accurate climate predictions than ever before. You can read more about the climate project um, at, at the link below uh, in the source there. At Google, we really see our environment and our responsibility to it as one of our top priorities. Um, and to that end, we're looking forward to partnering much more closely with a number of climate agencies over the next few years and to being able to share publicly what we've been working on with those agencies. One thing I can share though, uh, is that we've been working on related, uh, uh, working on issues related to um, climate change, specifically energy consumption within Google. Um, a few years ago, the number one supercomputer was using about 17 megawatts of electricity. That's about the electrical usage of a small, medium-sized uh, town in the U.S. As we go towards exascale, the impact could uh, reach hundreds of megawatts, and that's about the electrical usage of uh, the city of San Francisco. So. Um, it's very important to us, especially considering the, the scale and the global nature of the, um, you know, the cloud that we offer and the infrastructure that we run, not only for Google Cloud, but also for all of our other services, <clears throat> that we um, focus on renewable energy and, and carbon um, neutrality and, and carbon freedom. So Google is proud to offset 100% um, of our energy usage with renewable energy. It has since 2017. That makes us one of the largest purchasers of renewable energy in the world. Um, and we're also carbon neutral and have been since 2007. We've also committed to making our global operations carbon uh, free, completely carbon free 24 seven um, by the end of the decade, by 2030. So um, as, we, as we think of um, you know, some of the most important challenges outside of our planet um, for just a second, you know, um, I'll just full screen this so that you can focus on it a little bit better. Um, you know, finding potential life-bearing worlds among the stars is, is NASA's next biggest challenge. So in order to find some of these planets uh, that are outside of our solar system, sometimes called exoplanets, <laughs> NASA has used um, Hubble, Kepler, uh, a number of telescopes, including now the James Webb Space Telescope, to monitor the light that's been coming from stars. Um, over time, looking for any variation in the color or the, or the intensity of the light that the telescope picks up. Um, the resulting images that we get are called light curves. You can see that curve on the right there. Um, so as, as planets orbit and pass the telescope's field of view, the luminosity drops and the color spectrum changes. Um, and that is, allows us to actually tell the size, the temperature, and even the atmospheric composition of these, these exoplanets. Um, that then allows us to identify how well any of these exoplanets are suited to life uh, and to possibly hosting life like ourselves um, so that we can concentrate on those exoplanets for future observations. Um, the whole process generates terabytes and terabytes of data each month. Um, 
and researchers had struggled to comb and process through all of this data in a, in a timely manner, right? Um, the analyzing a single light curve actually took several days, uh, and it only had an accuracy of about 94%. Um, so th this challenge really led NASA's Frontier Development Laboratory, FDL, to reach out to Google um, and working together and using uh, some of Google's machine learning services running on um, our, our compute engine, specifically AutoML, um, that you can read about more. NASA was able to actually reduce the analysis time to just a few seconds while actually improving the accuracy. Um, furthermore, they're able to parallelize a lot of this processing so they can uh, evaluate multiple exoplanets at once rather than processing them serially, which is what they were doing previously. More recently, um, we actually announced a partnership with the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, uh, which is formerly known as the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or LSST, which most people actually still know it as. Um, and we've partnered with them to serve as the data backbone to handle the collection, processing, and distribution of the 20 terabytes a day of astronomical data um, that they collect from um, that telescope in Chile. Um, so they actually have to get that data off of the telescope in a raw format transport it to be processed, um, and then actually uh, distribute it out to researchers around the world. Um, so it's a, a very computationally complex, and um, if you think about it, a, a networking challenge just to move all of that data in a timely manner so that it can be processed and then redistributed across the globe as well. So um, if we think about some of the infrastructure and the technology at play in all of these use cases, um, and, and especially how AMD brings improvements uh, and, and new capabilities to the table, we really have to look at three key areas. Um, that's compute, network, and storage, the same three key areas that really is core to any HPC use case. So um, Google's Compute Engine is really designed for flexibility, uh, performance, and security. We'll dive a little bit more into some of the details about Compute Engine in the next few slides. Um, networking is also essential to Google's compute operations, not just VM to VM networking, but our global network. So we'll talk about both as well. Um, and then storage, of course, um, Google's offerings are, are plentiful and varied in terms of storage. Um, we include object blocks uh, file as well as a number of other options. Um, and we'll talk about those, but obviously storage is key to any HPC application. And then we'll talk about also in the course of all of this, how we can make um, all of these tools cost effective and what tools are built to all of these things to make it cost effective. So if we look at our um, virtual machine families, um, the, we have a number of them uh, all the way from the cost optimized E series instances through our memory optimized uh, M series instances. These uh, VM families are really a mixture of Intel and AMD processors across the board, uh, as well as NVIDIA GPUs. Um, you can, our, our entire compute engine is really made to be as flexible as possible. So um, on a number of these VM families, you can do what's called custom machine types, where you can actually set a specific ratio or num uh, amount of cores and RAM for your specific VM. So if your application, um, say, needed 10 cores and 100 gigabytes of RAM and one GPU, you would be able to very easily create a, a custom VM that's, that fits that exact specification. So very similarly, you could also do 10 cores and 10 gigabytes of RAM, right? So you can very specifically mix and match and define an instance profile that maybe doesn't fit within our predefined instance profiles, but that matches your workload much more specifically and can save you money. That, that can save up to about 19% cost savings. Um, so there are a number of things like that. Um, we'll get into a, a few more of them as well. Um, that can not only save you money, but also improve the performance of your HPC applications uh, because of the flexibility built into our um, Google Compute Engine. And if you're interested in learning more about how it is that Google Compute Engine is so flexible, um, you can read about Borg, which is the um, underlying hypervisor and, and scheduler, which is really sort of the predecessor to Kubernetes. So it's our Google global scale Kubernetes that really runs all of our Compute Engine and the entire cloud. At its, at its foundation. Um, I want to focus very specifically, though, on a few of these. Um, for HPC, 
mostly on the general purpose VMs, specifically the M2D family, um, and then the compute optimized VMs, which um, specifically the C2 and C2D um, VM families. The N2D and the C2D are our AMD VM families. You can tell them because of the D at the end. Um, and they really represent two of our best uh, HPC focused VM families that are available today. I can't share too much about the C2D VM family without an NDA. Um, we announced that, uh, that it would be available towards the end of this year uh, with AMD. Just recently, that'll be based um, on our um, next generation AMD Epic processor. However, I can share um, more about, uh, I can share a little bit, uh, specifically you can expect a high clock speed, large core count, high memory band with AMD VM family. Um, that'll be a really great uh, platform for memory bound HPC codes um, and serve as an alternative to our Intel Cascade Lake based C2 VM family. Um, that's really more focused on compute bound workloads. Um, but I can dive into a little bit more about the N2D family though. So looking at the N2D family, um, these instances are powered by our AMD Epic ROM second generation processors. Each of them uh, offers, each VM offers up to 224 vCPUs. Those are hyper-threaded vCPUs. You can of course enable and disable hyper-threading on Google uh, Compute Engine so that you could uh, you know, have 112 cores there. And then we have, um, 896 gigabytes of, of memory at most in a single VM. The entities are a really good choice for memory, bandwidth limited, um, general purposes application, um, especially when compared to the Intel uh, based equivalent, the N2 family. On the right, you can see um, some of the results from an image rendering benchmark from Blender um, that were run across all of our uh, major VM families. And you can actually see that the N2D instance uh, ran the benchmark quicker and at a lower cost than any other VM family with the C2 VM family following just behind. Um, so it gives you a, a really good glimpse into where even general purpose AMD based processors can perform better um, and often, uh, often offer a better price performance ratio than even um, some higher clock speed alternatives, which the C2 is a higher clock speed um, part than the N2D part. Although the C2D part, will be even higher clock speed. So I mentioned um, security as being core to the, the Google Compute Engine. And uh, we at Google really believe that protection of sensitive data is paramount and encryption is really the best mechanism to accomplish this goal. For years, we've supported encryption at transit um, when our customers ingest their data to bring it into the cloud. We also support encryption at rest by default uh, for stored data across uh, all of our cloud services. And encrypting data in transit and at rest is great, but it's not really um, sufficient for all of our customers' needs. Um, customers really bring their data to the GCP for, for one main reason, they wanna process their data quickly and securely. Um, and so to complete the data pro uh, protection life cycle, we would like to be able to protect data when it's processed as well. So uh, to that end, we partnered with AMD to announce our confidential VM families. So uh, what are confidential VMs? They're uh, basically just like a regular VM. Um, any workload that you can run on a regular VM, you can run on a confidential VM. The only difference is that you click a checkbox. That makes it a confidential VM. And when you do that, all of the memory pages in the confidential VM are encrypted. This is actually using uh, AMD's SEV, um, which was alluded to earlier, um, but basically, um, you might ask, you know, if, if uh, all the memory pages are encrypted, how does the CPU process them? Basically, the data is encrypted in memory and it's decrypted when it's fetched uh, from memory to the CPU. The keys are generated uh, on the CPU and hardware, and the keys are all ephemeral and not persisted anywhere. So they can't be extracted from the CPU chip by anyone, um, including ourselves. So basically, each VM is um, encrypted in it with its own unique key per VM. Um, and customers are finally able to protect their data from end to end um, without us being able to uh, access it at any time, you know, even if we wanted to. Uh, finally, in terms of uh, compute, scalability and ease of use are absolutely essential to a good user experience on the cloud. So we recently introduced the bulk API, which is a feature built directly into the Compute Engine API that allows you to actually request up to a thousand instances in a single API request. Um, 
that can reduce your large scale VM creation times by up to 500% um, compared to doing things like HTTP batched API calls uh, or uh, sequential calls if, if that's what you're doing. Um, not only that, but uh, the bulk API can actually do capacity finding within a region. That way you know that your single API call will place your capacity quickly and reliably given that it will actually go and find that capacity without you needing to possibly uh, retry and search for capacity across zones. We're working very diligently to integrate this capability into more and more uh, partner and open source software. It's already been released as part of the latest Slurm integrations, um, and you can expect to see um, more announcements about Bulk API and other new features being integrated into other um, schedulers and uh, storage partners and other partners as well uh, in the near future. Um, covering storage very quickly, I mentioned we have a whole lot of storage types, and we definitely do. Um, all sorts of database options and uh, you know, analytical options there in, in the colored boxes. Um, but looking at the gray boxes very quickly, object block and file are really key for HPC. Um, Google Cloud Storage is uh, an exascale object storage system. We've had customers pull tens of terabits of data per second out of Google Cloud Storage to a couple thousand VMs. So we know that cloud storage is you know, one of the most powerful storage systems ever built. Um, I think the biggest difficulty for most users is uh, interfacing with object storage. So if uh, you have the opportunity, um, definitely consider um, trying to leverage object storage as much as possible. We've had a number of customers uh, rewrite their applications and see tremendous improvements in storage performance by doing so, even from very uh, large, powerful uh, luster systems, which we also offer. Um, block storage comes in a couple of flavors, uh, persistent disk and local SSD, uh, both appear as local disks. Uh, persistent disk is actually backed by the Google file system, so you have a lot more flexibility um, and capability in terms of snapshotting and replicating and having high throughput access to that persistent disk. Local SSD is NVMe uh, physically attached to the node. And then we have a number of uh, file offerings, both uh, first party with our file store NFS, but also partnerships with a number of uh, folks that you'll see in a little bit, but I'll just highlight um, DDN, Dell, um, NetApp, um, WAMCloud, uh, a number of other storage providers that um, you'll see in, in a few slides um, that are relevant to HPC. Um, but I would just say that we have a number of Lustre offerings, both uh, from DDN, from other partners, and uh, open source Google developed uh, offerings. So um, we're, we're more than happy to talk about all sorts of offerings in terms of storage. When you look at our network, uh, when Google thinks of networking, we really think first of our global network. So um, Google's unique in that we have the largest uh, cloud network of any um, cloud provider. We actually, um, if you look at the world's internet traffic, we support up to 40% of the world's internet traffic at any given point over our network. Um, and when you uh, have that much traffic, you really have to lay your own subsea cables, right? You can see a number of those um, in the background there. You could probably imagine uh, which cables handle the LSST traffic. Um, but when you lay your own subsea cables, this is one of my favorite parts about our network. You have to worry about things like shark attacks. Um, so for whatever reason, sharks are curious about the electromagnetic signals coming off of these wires. Um, and so they, they go and bite them. So we have a shark proof network, but we also have a very fast network. So um, the bisectional bandwidth of the entire internet is actually about 200 terabits per second. Um, if you looked at a single Google data center, it's over a thousand terabits per second. Uh, it's actually far more than that. I just can't find a source. The, the 2015 link at the bottom there is the best source I can find. So that's all I can actually cite. But um, you know, this kind of very fast networking um, is really important um, when you think about VM to VM um, within a data center communications, right? So um, in terms of VM to VM, we support 15,000 VMs per VPC. Um, today, that's going to go up very, uh, very quickly, very shortly. Um, our bandwidth is, is very, uh, it's a very easy formula to understand. It's two gigabits per second per vCPU. Uh, that goes up to 32 gigabits standard, and then there's 100 gig, up to 100 gigabits available with our advanced networking option. Our latency is very predictable and low. You can see um, some latency improvements um, 
uh, optimization steps on the graph on the right there that are documented in our MPI best practices um, that gets you down to about a 10 or a below uh, microsecond latency VM to VM. Um, we have our HPC VM image, which implements all of these best practices. So you can just get out of the box the best MPI performance possible, as well as those uh, best practices documented. And, uh, you know, core API, uh, core uh, features of the Compute Engine API like placement policies, which allow you to request compact placement of large, uh, large scales of VMs so that you can get very good MPI performance and latency between the VMs. So uh, network, good networking performance and good compute performance are obviously key. Um, just sticking with the theme here today of, of ANSYS, I just wanted to uh, pull in this slide very quickly of um, an ANSYS Fluent benchmark. This is the Formula One race car, 140 million cells uh, workload. And you can see that um, our, even our software-defined networking um, and all of our great compute partnerships um, are capable of, of delivering very good HPC performance on some of the toughest workloads. And then, um, you know, at, at, at Google, we know in HPC, uh, partnerships are essential. So we're very proud of our partnership with Ansys. But we also have a, a very large and growing community of partners. Uh, we have integrations with a large number of open source and third party job schedulers, HPC platforms, storage solutions, um, like I mentioned earlier, um, and ISVs like ANSYS, uh, TIPCO, uh, et cetera. We focus really on partnering together with these organizations and open source projects and really contributing resources and time as much as possible to improve the tools and the technology for everyone really trying to open source as much as, uh, as possible what we do um, and document it for everyone to not only uh, utilize, but improve upon and contribute back to themselves. So um, Plurm and our partnership with ScanMD is, is really a good example of that kind of collaboration uh, that's not only brought about a new set of tools, but also improvements to the core open source project itself. Um, so at Supercomputing 2017, we actually announced our partnership with SCEDMD, who are the commercial backers and maintainers of the Slurm Workload Manager. We collaborated with SCEDMD to build a set of open source tools and improvements to Slurm that would facilitate cloud native operations of Slurm. Um, so these integrations support three main modes of operation. Um, first, we have cloud auto scaling that allows users to really create a standalone cloud-based Slurm cluster uh, with a single command, very easy uh, configuration file and, and a single command to launch the cluster. That creates your network, that creates your firewall rules um, and creates your VMs and installs Slurm, et cetera. Um, then Slurm also has the ability to manage auto scaling nodes up and down to meet job requirements and queue depth. Um, so not only will it spit up instances, if you, you know, request a thousand instances, um, it will use bulk API and spin those up very quickly but also spin them down according to an idle timeout, or if there's a queue of jobs coming in after it, right? Of course, it'll, it'll continue to service those jobs. We also have uh, Burst to Cloud and Federate to Cloud, um, which uh, is where an existing on-premises cluster can be configured to auto-scale cloud-based virtual machines or allocate jobs to separate clusters to offload jobs from, from on-premises. So uh, at Supercomputing 2017, we actually had Rutgers University um, create a five cluster Slurm Federation. They had three clusters distributed across the various Rutgers campuses. Um, and then they had a cluster on the conference floor. And then they had a Google Cloud based cluster running and they were distributing jobs between all five clusters. So a uh, great example of the use of the Slurm on GCP code uh, and as a way to tie back to the, to the topic of solving some of the world's toughest problems that I started the, this, this discussion on um, is Harvard Medical School's efforts around studying SARS-CoV-2. Um, so actually back in February, we had been partnering with Harvard, Harvard Medical School for um, a few months to help them build their virtual drug screening platform called Virtual Flow um, that runs on Slurm on Google Cloud. They had loaded actually 1.4 billion chemical compounds into the platform already as a baseline. Um, and, and they set off on their primary goal of discovering really the next aspirin. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting team and the, the virtual flow software is open source and on GitHub. Um, but after the pandemic started uh, hitting the US um, the, uh, and, and the data about SARS-CoV-2 became available in February, they pivoted their, their focus uh, to screening all of these 1.4 billion compounds against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. 
they actually um, screened all of those compounds in five days in, in, uh, in February, and um, they used 75 million CPU hours and 80,000 vCPUs um, using Slurm to do this. Uh, that actually resulted in them finding 16 proteins and 40 target sites that uh, were potentially active against SARS-CoV-2 and that warranted further research. Um, so they were, they were very happy with the, the results for their first real world uh, trial of the virtual flow platform. Um, and you know, speaking of supporting research, uh, we really aim to uh, support the research community as much as possible, especially in terms of doing research in the cloud. We've partnered with the National Institute of Health uh, for a number of projects over the years. Um, currently, we have the Strides program and the Cloud Bank most prominently, uh, but we also have a number of our own research uh, support programs. Most recently, the Research Innovations, uh, sorry, the Research Innovators program uh, was launched for people with innovative ideas uh, around a research area for us to um, support them, not only in terms of credits, but also in terms of subject matter experts and engineers on the Google side who are willing and, and able to help them um, bring their research to fruition. We also have the Public Datasets program that hosts a, a large amount of data, um, and will host things like the LSST data, um, research credits program and the academic credits program for uh, academic researchers. And then um, specific to COVID-19, we are not only part of the White House's COVID-19 HPC consortium with a number of other um, folks in the HPC space, but we also um, started our research credits program with tens of millions of dollars of credits uh, devoted to it to fund H, uh, HPC research around COVID-19. So really, we're, we're very excited to see what new problems people come to us with over time as we continue to support not only researchers, but continue to integrate more partners and open source projects to use Google Cloud and continue to work towards democratizing high performance computing. Thank you so much. <laughs>